Hi, I'm Chris Haig and this is the Fiddle Channel. Today we're going to look at how to play a solo on Sweet Georgia Brown. Stefan Grappelli and Django Reinhardt recorded this tune was the key of G um, and that's the key we're going to look at today but a lot of uh, his subsequent recordings in fact all, I think all of the ones that I've seen where he wasn't playing the Django he has taken it down to the key of F. Most of the licks we're going to look at today are transcribed from Grappelli and those based on the original recording are uh, left in the original key those that are taken from his subsequent recordings I have transcribed up so that they're in the same key of uh, G. Now before we go any further let's have a quick look at the chord sequence and you can see it's a slightly unusual sequence in that we have um, four bar sections of single chords so you've got uh, four bars of E7, four bars of A7, four of D7, uh, three of G and a little B7 and then we've got the E7 and A7 again. We've got a line of E minor, B7, E minor, B7. And then we've got a descending run, G, F sharp, F, E, A minor 7, D7, G. Now this sequence, uh, it's pretty easy to follow uh, from the point of view of that uh, you've got a lot of time to think about um, what you're going to do in each chord because you've got four bars of it. Quite often you will have half a bar or just one bar of each chord. So this is quite a forgiving sequence in that sense. Um, but one important thing to know is that uh, it starts on E7, but it's in fact in the key of G. And if you start either playing the whole key as if it was in E, or the whole thing as if it was in G, uh, then you're going to be in big trouble. Um, the first four lines are what's called a cycle of fifths. So it's moving down a fifth each line. So E uh, down to A, to, down to D, down to G is the cycle of fifths. And we start again, E to A, and then the last line, last two lines are a bit different. Uh, but we're going to go through it line by line and uh, mini sequence by mini sequence. First thing to know about playing on a seventh chord as opposed to a, a, a normal, like an E chord, is that obviously the seventh note is flattened. So a normal E. Uh, scale will be but an E7 has got a, a D natural that's a flattened seventh so let's look at a, a typical lick that you might use and this is uh, lick one So notice we went up the scale, played the D natural, and then we're playing the D repeatedly, kind of accenting the fact that it's a seventh. It's important to get these sevenths accented because the, the whole purpose of a seventh chord in jazz is as an engine of movement. So an E7 is unstable and it's uh, constantly driving towards moving to A. And the fact that it's an A7 means that it's then still unstable and wants to move towards D. And it's not till we get to the G that it's actually a stable chord. If we're looking at the A chord, um, you can do arpeggios without the sevenths if you want. So something like this. Uh, that works perfectly well, but it doesn't make uh, full use of the chord. But we'll just hear that one anyway with the chord. you can do an arpeggio which is kind of decorated and quite often people will have learnt some flashy arpeggio so this one so we're doing and then playing a semitone below that upper note Now, 
moving back to the E7 chord uh, from the um, Stefan Grappelli live album um, and transposed, we've got this. So we're going up, then we're going to fourth position. This is quite a lot easier in Grappelli's original key because uh, it means you don't have to do fourth position. If you don't want to do fourth position, then you could do this. Just stretch your fourth finger to get that top E. Let's hear that with the chords. Here's one from the original solo. This is a very elegant line because it's a big long descent. So we're going from the top B all the way to a bottom A and it's as if the whole thing is designed to reach that target note just as it hits the A chord. I'll give it once more slow. And that's, let's hear that. And notice how that one, as with a lot of his licks, it starts uh, on the beat before the chord. So that is the, where the, that bar actually starts. And it's very common for him either to start just before the bar line or just after the bar line. And that just kind of uh, breaks it up, makes it more interesting. Now, here's um, an iconic lick of Grappelli's. So you've got high E with your fourth finger. First finger on the B uh, in fourth position, and we're starting off uh, two bars before the bar line. Actually, that's the one which uh, Grappelli plays when uh, Django shouts out, One more step! And then he really digs in. And it's a really cutting lick, and that's the kind that Grappelli really liked because he had to fight over those three uh, <laughs> rhythm guitars. Now, the next one. Um, I have a feeling this is a quote from something, uh, but I'm not sure what. Uh, so what he's doing is he's playing this lick and then he's shifting it up out of key and then he does the same thing, he transposes it to the next chord. Let's see that with the chords. Pretty crazy thing to do, but he seems to get away with it. Uh, now let's look at a D7, and uh, again we're anticipating the chord change. So we're starting off one beat before, and then we've got those little harmonics done with the second finger and first finger in third position. Is what you're actually fingering. Here's another D lick which goes up, uh, again starting just before the bar line. how he finishes on a B note. It's a sixth of the D. Uh, in fact Django was very keen on uh, playing sixth over chords and I think uh, Grappelli must have picked it from him. 
Uh, now a G chord. Again, starting just before the bar line. So the G is an easy one, and he's doing a, um, a B flat on the way down, which is a blue note. And he's just repeating that kind of pedalling on the G. And then going down over the B7 chord. And here's another G1. This one is uh, a very interesting one because we, in the middle of the G chord, we go, to which is an E flat chord. And uh, I looked at a, a very nice video by Gabriel Bismu, uh, who analyzes Capella's original solo, and he says this is a tritone substitution. Uh, but I couldn't quite follow the reasoning. <laughs> but then I don't think that, that way. So here's the lick. Then we get to the E minor B7, and uh, there's usually space for um, something a bit different here. And one thing Grappelli does, he often opens out and kind of plays smooth over this. That's a nice one that he does. Some of you may recognise as the <laughs> beginning of Bach's double violin concerto, which made a lot more sense in the original key, in his original key of D minor. Um, I, when I was a terrified 15 year old, played this in front of the Huddersfield Town Hall and <laughs> um, didn't make a great job of it, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lovely piece and does transposally nicely to jazz. But anyway, here it is um, over those chords. Grappelli wasn't a big one for doing quokes, but when he did them, they were usually pretty successful. Um, now, here's another one on the E minor. This is another bluesy one, and uh, we get a nice substitution in bar three. So we start off two, three, four. So what's happening in bar three is we've got a diminished substitution, so we're turning the E minor into E diminished. So again from the beginning, two, three, four. And with the chords. Then we come to the, the rundown, and this isn't nearly as scary as it looks, um, G, F sharp, F, E. Um, what you can do is just to treat the whole thing more or less as G, or a kind of G blues. It's a kind of a rundown lick. just after the bar line. One, two, three, four, one. If you don't want to kind of skim over the chords at the end, you can do something like playing the roots thirds and fifths. Or if you were feeling really clever you could do
which is what Stuff Smith would probably do, but uh, I've, uh, I've tried that lots of times and usually only just got away with it. Uh, so I'll just give you that first one again. And then finally, um, not from Grappelli, this is from the gypsy guitarist Martin Weiss, uh, a really fine player. And he does, starts on, uh, if you put your second finger down on the B, put your first finger right next to it, just below. And then one, two, four, and you stretch up to the top E. And then you can repeat that all the way through the, um, the descending sequence and indeed into the next chord if you feel like it. So I hope you enjoyed these 20 licks. I do recommend that you don't uh, spend your time learning a whole solo. Uh, I know some people absolutely swear by transcribing whole solos, but to me it's a lot more useful to learn individual licks and attach them to chords and then you can mix and match so rather than learning a single solo which you can only use over the one song in that one key, if you learn the individual licks and separate them, then you can use them in all sorts of tunes for the rest of your life if you want. And to me that's far more efficient and effective. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you want a copy of these 20 licks then subscribe and send me an email to the address which is at the bottom of the description below the video. See you soon.